The CDLS has been established in 2010 by Dr. Carlos of the Graduate School and by personalities that have shaped our and their field of research. Um, through the years, we've had the honor to work on speakers such as Peter Lex, Gilbert Strang, or Pete Mola. Today, it's my honor to introduce the 12th German Distinguished Lecturer, Professor Jan de Kuhn. Uh, Jan de Kuhn is one of the top researchers in the field of machine learning, in particular deep neural networks with applications such as computer vision or speech recognition. His contributions to the field of machine learning impact our day-to-day -day life in many forms, like spam filters to identify spam emails, to identify handwriting, or to read bank checks, or just to find in a Google search all the red cars that you're looking for. Um, all this powerful technology just keeps improving apparently and will certainly be more prominent in our daily life in the future. Taking artificial intelligence problems through artificial neural networks is the red thread that runs through Mr. Lecun's career. Uh, in 1987, he got his doctoral degree at the Pierre M. R. Curie University in Paris with his thesis on learning algorithms for neural networks. After his postdoc at the University of Toronto, he took a position at the AT&T Bell Labs in 1988, where he worked on image compression and handwriting recognition, later moving up the ladder to become head of the image processing research department. During this time, Le Kuhn made outstanding contributions to an algorithm called Backpropagation, a learning algorithm for multi-layered artificial neural networks that is still used today. In short, the success of machine learning would not have been possible without Jan Le Kuhn's valuable contributions. Then in 2003, he joined New York University as a professor, where he became founding director of the NYU Center for Data Science. And in 2013, he became director of Facebook's AI research department, while retaining a part-time position at NYU. His accomplishments have been honored by the IEEE Computational Intelligence Society's 2014 Neural Network Pioneer Award. And for many of us, it's inspiring how the field of neural networks has developed and is developing still today. Just consider the endurance necessary to stick with the field, given that it emerged in the 1950s, and its success was not obvious for a long time after. With the emergence of deep neural networks in the recent years, machine learning is producing an unprecedented success story with applications to various tasks previously reserved just for humans. It seems that the field has blossomed over the last years and is taking on challenge after challenge. You can actually follow most of these advances online since machine learning is one of the most open fields that exist today. Professor Lecun will now give us some insight in some of the challenges that AI will take on in the near future. With no further ado, I'd like to invite over to Jan Lecun now for his talk on unsupervised learning Thank you, Marcus. Uh, thank you for the very nice introduction. It's a, a real pleasure to be here in the former capital of Europe. Um, hasn't been the capital of Europe for, for a while, but you know, you never know. It might be coming again. <laughs> um, it's only 1,200 years or so. Um, OK, so uh, I'm going to, uh, of course, talk about deep learning and talk about AI. Uh, I have a microphone here, but I'm not sure it works. Uh, can you guys hear me if I just, oh. it doesn't, okay. I'm just gonna use that one. Um, this is for the camera, right? Maybe. <laughs> um, and going back, going back in history, as Marcus uh, mentioned, the idea of neural networks actually goes back to the 1940s, but uh, the, the, the first trainable neural net, if you want, was the perceptron model of 1957 built at, at Cornell University by Frank Rosenblatt. And what you see here is a picture of the perceptron. Uh, on the uh, right side is kind of a sensor. It's not really a camera. It's an array of photosensors, something like 8 by 8 pixels or something like that. Um, then you have uh, a feature extractor, so this, this big uh, spaghetti plate of, uh, of, of wires here. 
uh, extracts local features from, the, from this image. And then uh, the classifier is on the right, and you see Frank Rosenblatt holding uh, a module of eight weights. Uh, so each weight is one of those little modules you see here, and it's a potentiometer with a motor on it. And so the learning algorithm consists in showing an image and then pressing a button, and then all the motors will turn in one direction or the other, uh, adjusting the weights. This was an analog computer. Uh, so the weighted sum of this classifier was computed by summing currents through those, those potentiometers. So this was not a program on a, on a digital computer. It was uh, an actual analog computer that was built, a physical computer. Uh, now we can replace this by, by you know, three lines of Python. Um, uh, and of course, run it much faster. But what it did was create the, the basic model for pattern recognition that uh, stayed with us for many years, which is the idea that you, you take a raw signal, you turn it into uh, a format that's digestible by a classifier, uh, so that's, that's called a feature extractor, and generally it's handcrafted. Uh, and then you plug a, a trainable classifier, in this case a, a linear classifier, that just simply computes a weighted sum of its inputs and compares the weighted sum to a threshold. If it's above a threshold, it's category one. If it's below a threshold, it's not category one. Uh, and you can have multiple of those uh, uh, classifiers for doing multi-class classification. Um, so essentially, you can see a learning machine, a classical learning machine, as a, a parameterized uh, function. Let's say, uh, you know, imagine this box with a bunch of knobs on it, right? And uh, the way you train it normally is using supervised learning, which I'm sure many of you uh, uh, have, have heard of uh, before. So, for example, if you want to classify images of cars from images of planes, you show an image of a car, and you want the red light to turn on when the car is presented. So if the red light doesn't turn on, you, you adjust the knobs in such a way that the red light brightness increases and the green light brightness decreases. And then you show an example of an airplane, and because you want the green light to turn on, you adjust the knobs a little bit so that the, the green light increases in brightness. And then if you repeat doing this with thousands of examples of cars and planes, eventually the system, if it's powerful enough, will settle on a configuration of the knobs that uh, turn on the correct light for the correct category. Uh, but of course, the the complication there is that you'd like the system to do a good job at recognizing images it's never seen before. So you might have shown it a certain number of examples of cars, but what if you show it a car, a type of car it's never seen before? And the magic of machine learning is that there are kind of provable results uh, uh, on the fact that if the distribution of samples kind of stays the same, uh, the, the system will be able to generalize, which means to recognize images it's never seen before as long as they have the same statistical characteristics as the one you use for training. Um, and so the, the main issue is how do you design this machine in such a way that it can deal with very uh, wide variations of appearance, uh, for example, for chairs or cars or airplanes. And the, the classical model of pattern recognition essentially uh, is not sufficient for this, or it is sufficient, but it's very painful in a sense that it requires a lot of effort from uh, engineers and scientists to design an appropriate feature, uh, feature extractor. So you have the, the classical model of pattern recognition at the top, which is inherited from the perceptron and was kind of you know, classical for many decades. Um, in the mid-2000, things kind of changed a little bit in some uh, part of the uh, area. Uh, it, it was kind of earlier for speech recognition that the model was, uh, was different. And what ha what's happened in the last uh, five to 10 years is the appearance of deep learning where the model here is to build the recognizer as a cascade of modules, all of which are trainable. So whereas in the past, only the last step in the recognition process was trainable, in the deep learning um, approach, uh, every, every layer is trainable uh, all at once. So the next, next question you have to figure out is what do you put in those boxes? Um, and then I'll come back as to why it's interesting to have this sort of multi-layer cascade of, of modules. So what do you put in those boxes? The classical neural net is uh, essentially a succession of two types of functions. Uh, you represent the input as a vector, so you can think of the pixel values uh, in, a, in an image as just a vector of values, for example. Um, and you multiply this vector by a matrix, uh, probably a sparse matrix. If you have a million pixels coming in, you can't just multiply by a million by a million matrix, so you're gonna have to uh, figure out how to build this matrix in such a way that it's not full. Uh, but conceptually, you multiply by a matrix, and then you take the result uh, of this multiplication, which is another vector, and you apply a nonlinear function to every component. 
And in modern versions of neural nets, this, uh, this function is uh, what's called a ReLU or half-wave rectification, the max of x and 0. It's not even a differentiable function, but it doesn't matter. Um, so it's you know, 0 for if x is negative, and it's equal to x if x is positive. It's a very, very simple nonlinearity. In the past, in neural nets, we use sigmoid functions, but we can replace them with this. So multiplication by matrix, pointwise nonlinearity, and then you repeat the process. Another matrix, pointwise nonlinearity, matrix, pointwise nonlinearity. Uh, the parameters on which the learning algorithm will operate are the coefficients in the matrices. So the coefficients in the matrices is what we need to learn. And they will determine the input-output function of that network. The way you do this is through, the, uh, through gradient descent. So what you have to do is to adjust those knobs so as to turn the knob in the direction that will increase the brightness of the correct light, if you want. You have to figure out in which direction to change the value of one of the coefficients in the matrices in such a way that uh, some error function that measures the discrepancy between the output you want and the output you get decreases. And that information, of course, is given to, to you by uh, a gradient vector. So a gradient is just an indication, uh, a value for each parameter that indicates if I modify this parameter by delta, the, the objective function I want to minimize will be uh, modified by, by some value. And that value divided by delta, that's the gradient. So um, what uh, makes, makes it easy to train multilayer neural nets, uh, deep learning system, is the fact that it's very easy to, f to compute those gradients more or less automatically. Uh, you could think of this as kind of a simple form of automatic differentiation. And since there are all, you know, a lot of people at uh, ISIS and uh, other UTH who, who use this for scientific computing, numerical uh, operation, then I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, this idea of uh, automatic differentiation. So back, the backpropagation algorithm is basically just an application of chain rule, uh, which says if a function is the result of applying uh, a sequence of functions to an input, so we apply first function f1, then f2, f3, etc., until fn, uh, then to compute the gradient, you, you have to propagate gradients, you have to kind of propagate information backwards in the reverse order in which the, the, the module are, are, uh, are, are connected. And it's really just an application of a chain rule in the sense that if you want to know the gradient of some objective function with respect to the input of a module, it's equal to the gradient of this objective function with respect to the output of that module multiplied by the Jacobian matrix of that module. And that's just a function that you can implement for each module and, and just sequence very easily. So all the software framework that um, are designed for deep learning, whether it's the Torch, which is the thing we use at Facebook, or TensorFlow, which is the Google uh, version, uh, TNO, which came out of the University of, of uh, Montreal, uh, or other frameworks of this type, KRS, MXNet, etc. They all use this model where you build uh, a neural net by assembling modules and it kind of automatically figures out how to compute the gradient um, of uh, whatever objective function you put on top with respect to the parameters in the system. <coughs> That's just the basic idea of backprop. Okay, and th then the next thing is how do you specialize those linear operations in situations where your input is, let's say, an image? Uh, so there, you can't afford to take all the pixels in an image and multiply that by a matrix. You can in the case of handwriting recognition because it's small enough, but at least with modern machines. But uh, if the image is, you know, uh, you know, several hundred or several thousand pixels by several thousand pixels, uh, you can't you can't afford to do that. Just you know, take all the pixels as a big vector and multiply by a matrix. That's just too expensive. Um, there is another reason for not doing this, which is that images are very structured there is a lot of local structure in an image. And that where, that's where the idea of convolutional network uh, com comes in. So this is something I've, I've worked on for a very long time, uh, which I started working on in the late 80s when I was a postdoc at the University of Toronto, and, and after that at, at Bell Labs in the late, late, uh, late 80s. Uh, at that time, uh, the only thing we could apply this to was uh, character recognition, because that's the only thing for which we had data. And also the computers were not fast enough to do anything else. And so the basic idea of a control net is that um, instead of uh, having a generic matrix to kind of transform the input into features, we're going to use a convolution. So a convolution is uh, the following operation. You take a neighborhood on the image and you compute the dot product of the pixels within this neighborhood with a, a vector of weights uh, symbolized by this little array here. So compute the dot product of this window by those weights. And then the weighted sum is put uh, in the output array. And then you take this window and you slide it over the entire image. 
and you put the results in sort of corresponding locations in the output. This operation is a discrete convolution for people who know a bit of signal processing or mathematics. You probably see this right away, which is why those networks are called convolutional nets. Um, so after that, you pass the result to a nonlinearity. In this particular case, it's actually a sigmoid nonlinearity. This is an old uh, convolutional net from the late 80s, early 90s. Late 80s, actually, this one. Um, and then there is a second type of operation here called pooling, which takes a neighborhood of activities at the output of one of those uh, feature maps. So I should say first that each of those feature maps is the result of applying a different filter of this type to the input image. Uh, so extracting a different feature at, at, uh, at all locations in the image. So why are we doing this convolutionally? It's because, uh, first of all, images have lots of local structures. Lo local structure. So in an image, neighboring pixels are very likely to have similar values, which means that if you take a patch of, of pixels in a natural image, uh, not all combinations of pixels will be observed. Only certain combinations of pixels will be observed. And so there is an advantage in representing local patches of pixels because of those correlations. It wouldn't be true if you took random uh, pixels far away from each other. Um, second, the statistics of natural images is invariant with uh, location. So whenever a particular type of feature is uh, advantageous, uh, the, the detection of a particular type of feature is advantageous at one location, it's probably a good idea to detect it everywhere in the image because that feature can appear in different locations depending on where the object appears and its orientation and size and shift, etc. So that's the basic idea of convolutional net. And in fact, the original idea of this has its roots in neuroscience. So um, uh, this classic work in neuroscience by Hugo and, and Riesel in the late 50s and early 60s is so classic that they you know, won a Nobel Prize for it. And what they did was figure out what the neurons in the visual cortex were, were doing, in the visual cortex of a cat in particular, and figured out that neurons were connected to a local patch in the visual field. Um, and what they also figured out, and they call, they call those cells the simple cells that detect local features, and they were kind of repeated all over the visual field. And the second thing they noticed is that there are complex cells, and those complex cells basically integrate the activity of simple cells within an area. So that's what this pooling operation does. It takes a neighborhood of values from one of those filters, and uh, from one of those uh, feature maps, and then computes uh, an average or a max of all the values within this neighborhood, and puts the result here. Uh, the thing is, the, this window is stepped by possibly more than one pixel so that the resolution of this map is lower than the resolution of that map. Uh, the pixels are twice the size here as they are here. And then you repeat this pair of operations. So here, uh, this uh, feature map here applies a filter, a different filter to each of those feature maps, adds up the result, passes that through a nonlinearity, and then the result goes through pooling again and subsampling. And so as you go up the, the layers, the representation gets more and more abstract, more and more global, in the sense that one unit at the top gets influenced by a large area at the bottom. Uh, and, uh, and, and you get more and more types of features that kind of represent the, the category, if you want, of what, what's being observed. So here is a, so this idea of uh, simulating something like this on a computer uh, was first done by a gentleman called Kuni Fukushima in Japan at the uh, uh, NTT lab at the time. And he had a model called the neocognitron, but he didn't quite have the kind of supervised learning algorithm that Backprop was, was providing. So he was using some sort of competitive and supervised learning algorithm. Um, so this is kind of an example of one of those convolutional nets in action, uh, you know, from the early 90s. And what you see is that the, uh, the, the, the activation here, so each pixel the, the, the gray level of each pixel corresponds to the activation of one particular unit that detects uh, a feature in a local uh, location. Uh, this is the kind of subsampled version of this passed through nonlinearity, and then those are kind of high level features that are again pooled and subsampled, and then passed through uh, another set of uh, filters and nonlinearities. When you get to this, uh, to this layer here, which is just a couple layers from the, the output, you get uh, uh, kind of delocalized uh, representations that really characterize the content of the entire image with a lot of invariance to shift and distortions and things of that type. So people, uh, so you know, I've been working on this for a long time. This was pretty successful in the mid-90s since we built uh, hand chain recognition systems and, and, and character recognition systems that were widely deployed to read checks and, and things like that. Uh, but people lost interest in those techniques in the, around 1995 or so. The reason being that those techniques at the time were very difficult to uh, uh, 
to kind of, it was difficult to make that mark. You had to have kind of a lot of uh, expertise. You had to have the right uh, type of software infrastructure to make it work, which you had to write yourself because uh, you know there was no there was no MATLAB, there was no Torch, there was no Python. Uh, so you kind of had to write your own your own things, and it was kind of a big effort. There was no internet really at the time. We're talking 1990 um, between 1990 and 1995. So if you had an idea, and if you work for a company or university, the idea of releasing your code in open source was not widespread, and so. It wasn't easy for people to just download a piece of code and, and kind of play with it. Um, it just, people didn't do this at the time. People didn't distribute their code. And so because it was difficult to make it work, because the software was uh, a big investment, because the technique were kind of complicated to, uh, to operate, and because we couldn't exchange code, uh, people lost interest in this because it was just too hard. So I had the reputation of being the only person who could make those things work, which was of course not true. Um, but it was a good excuse for people not to work on this. Um, and so there was essentially no action in this kind of uh, area between roughly 1995 and sort of the early 2000, 2003 or so. And then in 2003, uh, a couple of, uh, I, I joined a university um, and um, uh, a couple of uh, uh, my colleagues and I uh, kind of started a conspiracy, if you want. Uh, so this is uh, Yosha Benjo, Jeff Hinton and, and myself. And we started a conspiracy to revive the interest of the machine learning community into those, those methods. Um, and so we started to organize a series of workshops and, uh, and meetings and summer schools to kind of you know, get people acquainted with those methods. And we came up with sort of new methods based on unsupervised learning that started to open the door to kind of a new way of training those, those networks using very, very deep networks. Um, but eventually, we figured out that we could actually train those networks with backprop, uh, just you know, plain supervised learning. And so what you hear about, the reason you hear about AI over the last few years, the reason why people talk about AI again, uh, uh, you know, in the last three, four years, is because of the success of deep learning and mostly because of the success of supervised deep learning and mo mostly because of the success of convolutional nets as well as recurrent nets, uh, which I'll talk about later in a little bit. So, Here's an example of a large convolutional net uh, from a few years ago that was trained to recognize uh, uh, images from natural images from the ImageNet dataset. So ImageNet dataset has uh, 1 million, 1.2 million training samples, um, 1,000 categories, and it turns out as soon as the dataset is big enough, those networks start to work really well. They scale much better than alternative techniques, and they start beating the techniques that rely on handcrafted features. So if you have handcrafted features, the number of parameters in your system is relatively small. So you can get away with getting decent performance with a small data set, a small training set. But as, as soon as the training set becomes very large, uh, those uh, networks don't have those, those kind of classical methods with a handcrafted feature extractor, don't have enough flexibility to really capture all the complexity of the, of the system. And that's when convolutional nets start uh, you know, taking over, essentially. And so in 2013, the ImageNet competition was won by um, a team from uh, Jeff Hinton's lab in, in, in Toronto, Alex Kujewski and uh, Ilya Suskever. And they uh, beat the more classical methods by such a huge margin that basically everybody gave up uh, working on those alternative methods and started switching to convolutional nets. And that's started the deep learning revolution in computer vision. The deep learning revolution started in speech recognition a little earlier than that. Um, maybe a year or two uh, before that, where people, including people at, uh, in Aachen, had been experimenting with using uh, neural nets for acoustic modeling and speech recognition. And those things started to work really, really well around 2011, 2010, uh, in the labs of uh, Google, Microsoft, and, uh, and IBM, uh, among others, as well as you know, university labs like, like here. And, and that revolutionized speech recognition. What's been happening over the last few years is that a similar revolution is happening in natural language understanding and uh, machine translation where neural nets are kind of taking over those fields as well. So it's been sort of uh, percolating in just about every uh, area of uh, pattern recognition, generally speaking. So why is it that it's a good idea to have multiple layers? It's a bit of a mystery and it's still a theoretical mystery but uh, there are at least good intuitions for why this is the case. Uh, so if you, take, if you look at the, the type of features that maximally activate certain units in one of those convolutional nets, these are visualizations that were produced by uh, Rob Fergus and Matt Zeller a few years ago uh, at NYU. And you, you can tell that the, the low-level features are very simple things like oriented edges and color contrast. 
a couple of layers up, you start having uh, combinations of those features that form motifs like, like circles, corners, gratings, uh, things like that. And then a couple of layers up, you have uh, detectors that fire for like, parts of objects that are relatively complex. And then all the way to the top, you have you know, detectors for categories. And so why is it that you need multiple layers for this? Um, and the basic argument is that the natural data, the natural world is compositional. So, you know, objects are combinations of parts, parts are combinations of motifs, motifs are combinations of elementary features. And you have the same kind of hierarchical uh, compositionality structure in uh, text, in speech, in uh, audio, whatever it is, in just about any natural signal. Uh, it's just because the world itself is compositional, right? Uh, molecules are formed by atoms, atoms by elementary particles, and then, you know, objects by combinations of uh, molecules, etc. Um, so what's true at a fine-grained level is true also at kind of a major level. In fact, uh, there is a, 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 a saying that I, I like from a colleague at Johns Hopkins University called Jim uh, Eisner, who says, uh, the world is compositional or there is a God. This is what makes the world understandable, essentially. Um, so as I said, there is quite a bit of inspiration from, from, from biology and from neuroscience uh, in the design of those networks. But it's a very weak uh, uh, inspiration. So we're not trying to copy the brain. We're just trying to get some general idea from the brain and on how to design those networks. And uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But what we need to do is really understand what the underlying principles are. So um, uh, copying the brain blindly without really understanding what the underlying principles are doesn't work. So the same way uh, the early pioneers of aviation uh, were sometimes copying birds or bats, and others had a kind of more engineering approach, were kind of getting inspiration from birds and bats, but were kind of following more of a you know, trying to understand really what the relevant quantities were. Uh, the first category of people who kind of blindly copied biology, you never heard from them. You, you never heard about them. Uh, the second category, they are the people who actually built airplanes that were practical. And so it's, there's a lesson to remember here, which is that uh, copying biology too closely without understanding why biology does it in a particular way uh, is bound to fail. You have to understand the underlying principles. So that's kind of my, my life's... Uh, quest, if you want, is, is sort of under, un, understanding the underlying principles of intelligence, whether this intelligence is artificial or natural, but, um, uh, but not necessarily copying uh, nature in all of its details. So what we've seen over the last few years is a, uh, a kind of an explosion of the complexity and the number of layers in those deep learning systems for image recognition or speech recognition. Uh, so here are uh, three generations. Um, so what you saw uh, just a couple of slides ago was the kind of second generation convolutional net, the first one that really worked really well on natural images uh, with large data sets, which had something like 10 or 12 layers. Uh, but what we're seeing now is, you know, three years ago, the kind of winning contestant had something like 20 layers. Uh, and then shortly later, the, the Google uh, proposed something called the inception architecture that they call Google Net, which is a play on word on Lonet, which is the name that my boss gave to those networks back at Bell Labs in, many years ago, uh, which has, you know, 30, 40 layers and fairly complex architecture. And more recently, uh, uh, Kang Ming He, who was at the time at Microsoft Research Asia, who is now at Facebook AI Research, came up with this architecture called ResNet, which basically allows uh, people to stack anywhere between 50 and 100 layers without kind of paying the price for it, which is kind of amazing. And those things work really well. They're very popular at, at the moment. Uh, they're based on the idea that uh, you need to have connections that skip pairs of layers. And so by default, the, those skip connections implement the identity function. And what the neural net itself is implementing is the deviation from the, uh, from the uh, identity function. So res stands for residual. So those are called residual networks. Uh, and that turns out to kind of make the backprop algorithm perform better if you have many layers, but uh, it also makes the network very inefficient in the sense that most of the layers don't actually do anything. So pretty early on in the 90s, we figured out we could use those conventional nets not just to recognize individual digits, but also to recognize multiple objects without explicit segmentation. So it's kind of a way of doing simultaneous 
recognition and segmentation, which of course is something that speech recognition people were very aware of, that you have to kind of recognize and segment at the same time. You can't just do one before the other. Um, but the, but commercial nets can do this for images and kind of figure it out, you know, when this is a three and a one or a five and a one or, uh, or five and a seven and things like that. Um, in the uh, 90s and early 2000s, we could also apply this to uh, natural image uh, tasks like uh, face detection and, and, and things of that type. But the computer vision community was really not paying attention to those results because they weren't, they were, you know, good or better than classical uh, other techniques, but not with a big enough difference that, that people really had no choice but paying attention. Um, eventually, we, uh, this is in the mid-2000, around 2007 or so, we started applying this to um, mobile robot driving. And so this is a conventional net applied with a sliding window over the entire image. So we can recognize every uh, region in the image as being traversable or not. And, and that system trains itself online by collecting uh, labels from a stereo revision system that tells it whether something sticks out of the ground or not in the short range, up to about 10 meters. And then uh, you can train the system online to kind of classify all the pixels in the, uh, in the image. And, and figure out when, when things are traversable. So those uh, uh, things can be put in a, in a map and, and the robot can, can drive using this map uh, and uh, even if it's being annoyed by those pesky graduate students <laughs> who are very confident that the robot is not going to break the leg because they actually wrote the code for it. Uh, so this is Raya Hassel who um, is now the head of the robotics research group at DeepMind in London, and Pierre Samanet, who is um, uh, at Google Brain, uh, also working on robotics uh, in, uh, in California. Um, the next step was to, instead of just uh, classifying the windows in, a, in an image into two categories, whether it's traversable or not by, uh, by a robot, you really want the system to tell you what category uh, of object the pixel belongs to. So you want to classify all those pixels as road, these ones are as uh, sidewalk and building and uh, sky, tree, cars, pedestrians, etc. So this is a system that was built around 2009, 2010. Uh, and uh, to tell you, this is a, an interesting uh, idea for the sociology of science. Uh, so obviously you could use this for, for you know, self-driving cars. Uh, this is for, you know, far from being a perfect system. For example, those beige areas uh, that you see are classified as sand or desert, and this is the middle of Manhattan, so there is no <laughs> beach I'm aware of. This is actually the middle of NYU campus, uh, Washington Square Park. Um, but it's pretty obvious that if you can make a system work reliably on this task, you could, you could build self-driving cars and things of that type. Um, so in 2011, we, uh, in 2010, we submitted a paper to the, to CV, the CVPR conference, CVPR 2011. And this system was beating uh, other methods by uh, a decent margin and was faster than these other methods by a factor of 100. Uh, and so we were pretty sure the paper was going uh, to be accepted, uh, possibly as an oral. Instead, it was uh, soundly rejected. And most of the reviews were... Um, what the hell is a conventional net? So people had no idea what it was. The reviewers, at least, had no idea what it was and could not believe that a method they'd never heard of could uh, beat sort of more classical methods that were kind of fashionable at the time. And so this was 2000, you know, late 2010 when the reviews were, were done for, for CVPR 2011. We submitted the paper to ICML and you know, it was accepted as ICML. But then two years, late, two years later, uh, the, the image net competition took place, and three years later, everybody was working on conventional net. And nowadays, even last year, you could not actually get a paper accepted as CVPR unless you use conventional net. <laughs> so, in the space of a very small number of years, it went from a completely unknown technique that nobody was believing in to basically the dominant method that uh, you kind of have to use, otherwise, your paper gets rejected. And it, it says something about the kind of the type of sort of fashion phenomenon that there is in science and technology where um, you know, some model begins begin, become popular and then um, you can't do anything else. Um, a similar phenomenon took place in speech recognition also where speech recognition kind of the type of methods that were used were sort of incrementally improved over 
10, 15 years, you know, since the late 80s, essentially through the uh, uh, relatively recently. Uh, but the basic kind of model, the basic paradigm didn't change. Um, so, uh, so a number of companies kind of got interested in this idea of semantic segmentation for driving cars. So what you see here is a little video uh, from a company called Mobilize, an Israeli company that builds vision systems for cars. These were the systems that were used by the Tesla cars until recently. Uh, recently, though, those two companies divorced, and so Tesla now is using its own uh, vision system, but uh, at the time, they were using the mobilized system. Uh, similarly, NVIDIA, the company that makes GPUs, uh, on which all of those networks are trained, uh, got interested in also building a stack for self-driving cars. In fact, I'm going to show you a, a little example of video of this, if I may. So these are uh, former colleagues of mine from uh, Bell Labs who uh, actually joined NVIDIA, they, have, they run a, a lab in New Jersey and what they've, what they've done here is they've taken a, a, a car and the car has a, a camera looking out the window and they train it supervised to just emulate a human driver. So they have someone, someone drive the car <laughs> and this is before it's trained properly um, and this is after it's trained properly. And it just, you know, it just record the image and the steering angle from the person and just try, you know, learns to associate uh, the steering angle to a particular image. And then after uh, <laughs> a few hours of training, the thing kind of drives itself in uh, woods. And, you know, it doesn't need to have markings, you know, it can detect obstacles. And it's never been told when an obstacle is just kind of emulating the driver. This is actually a kind of uh, a modern version of a project that I worked on with these guys. Uh, in 2003, just, just at the time I was joining NYU, uh, where we, we had a, a similar system trained by imitation learning to drive a, a little robot uh, 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 through vision using a conventional net. Uh, at the time, the network was, was running on a fixed computer and the video was transmitted by radio, but now we can run this on you know, embedded machines directly in the car. Uh, so this, this project is making really fast progress and uh, is, is kind of part of the uh, several projects at NVIDIA to, to build self driving cars. Uh, relying on neural nets, relying on imitation learning, relying on mapping and more classical methods and object detection and everything. So, but this one purely is purely a conventional net uh, that maps images to steering angles. It works at night. Um, this you know, pretty, pretty impressive uh, demonstration. It's not entirely completely reliable enough that it can be uh, commercialized yet, but uh, it's pretty cool. Oh, I need to stop this. All right. Okay, here is another set of applications that uh, we've been working on at, uh, uh, at, at Facebook. This is not my work. This is work from you know, a group of researchers at Facebook AI Research. Uh, and the goal here is not, it's kind of similar to semantic segmentation. It's, it's not to uh, label the entire image, but kind of focus on objects and kind of draw the outline of the objects and then classify those objects. And it's basically a conventional net that has two sets of outputs. One set of output is just a category, and the other set of outputs is a map, a kind of a mask, if you want, of the object being recognized. It's sort of the dominant object at the center of the image. And if you apply this with kind of a sliding window over the image, you get all the objects. So these are some of the object uh, candidates that the system detects. Uh, and this is the kind of overall output you get from the system, where you get you know, the cell phones that are outlined, the person, the laptop, uh, Etc. You can e even detect people behind chicken wire, uh, people who you only see the heads. Uh, look at those folks in the back here, correctly identified, the frisbees identified, <laughs> broccolis, and Chinese dishes, uh, and uh, you can count sheets. <laughs> There's nothing that looked more like a sheep than another sheep, but uh, you know, those things can figure out the boundary between sheeps, where one sheep ends and then another sheep, sheep begins. Uh, except it makes a mistake for the sheep, the sheep is cut in half. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this is kind of a, the, the, the kind of results that, you know, if you'd asked a researcher in computer vision five years ago, they said that's you know, impossible, like you know, it's going to take us decades before we can, we can do this. Um, it, it went faster than expected. So people are making really fast progress. It's becoming, it's going to the point that, you know, uh, image recognition now is at the point that speech recognition was a few years ago where it's not entirely a solved problem, but things kind of work. 
And so there's still interesting uh, challenges, but not entirely. Um, I'm actually going to skip this for now. And kind of talk about uh, another topic, which is unrelated to image recognition, but, um, but related to how do we make machines more, inte machines more intelligent? So you know, how do we use deep learning and kind of learning-based uh, approaches for real AI? So perception is a, maybe a part of AI, but it's not a particularly kind of you know, intelligent part of AI. You know, any person and most animals can do vision pretty well, and you know, it's unconscious. Uh, it's pretty reactive, so you get, a, you get an image, you, you know, figure out what's in it, and that's it. You don't have complex reasoning to do. But what about tasks that are kind of more properly uh, human, that uh, require a bit of uh, reasoning, and kind of modeling the world, and things like this? And, and you'll be surprised, but neural nets don't have memory. So if you take a, a feed-forward neural net, you plug, it, plug an input, it produces an output, you replace the input, and the previous output is completely forgotten. There's no kind of memory of the past in the system, except in the weights that result from learning. Um, so one idea to kind of uh, have network uh, remember the past is to make the networks recurrent, so that the state of the network at time t is fed back to the input of this network so that it can remember its previous state and then make decisions that are kind of you know, sequential in, in a way. And that's the idea of recurrent nets. The problem with recurrent nets is that they don't have memory either because, the, because of the, the way recurrent nets are built, the, uh, the, uh, they, they are very quick to forget their initial state. And so that creates a number of problems. One of them is uh, kind of sometimes identified as kind of a technical <coughs> problem called the vanishing gradient problem. So it's the fact that because the evolution of a recurrent net in time uh, uh, you know, is, is such that the initial state is quickly forgotten. What that means is that when you propagate the gradients, there is essentially no influence of the initial state on the end state, which means the gradient descent doesn't work very well. Um, so, the idea <coughs> occurred to uh, uh, people in the past that uh, neural nets should have some more explicit memory, and so that's where the idea of LSTM, which, mean, which stands for long short-term memory, came up. Uh, this is a uh, work by uh, Seth Ochreiter and Jürgen Schmiedhuber. Uh, at the time they were in Germany, but uh, Jürgen Schmiedhuber now is, is, in, uh, is in Switzerland. And basically they, uh, what they did was augment a recurrent net with kind of a, a register. So by default, the evolution of the recurrent net is such that the recurrent net just copies its previous state to its next state. Uh, is basically the identity function, except if something happens in the in the input where the state can be changed. Okay, so by default, so it's kind of the similar idea of what's used in ResNet nowadays, that's, which is that by default the the dynamics of the system is kind of the identity function, and then you need some explicit action by the neural net to kind of change the the state. Um, so that's uh, quite successful. It's used by a lot of groups uh, for uh, processing sequential signals like uh, text, speech, uh, and various other things. Um, but it's insufficient for tasks where you need the network to kind of remember things from far away in the past and then kind of go back into its memory and access it to answer questions. And this is why people came up with the idea of memory network or memory augmented networks. Uh, so there's two types of networks of this type that came out of Facebook AI research. Uh, one work by uh, Weston, Chopra, and Board called Memory Networks. Another one called Stack Augmented Recurrent Neural Nets by Armand Joula and Tomasz Mikolov. Uh, all those people are in, in New York, at Facebook AI research in New York. And then a similar idea popped up uh, just three days later on archive uh, from DeepMind called the Neural Turing Machine, where the memory is kind of a tape, if you want. Um, and then since then, there's been a lot of work sort of building on those ideas. A uh, recent one uh, by, by DeepMind called the Differentiable Neural Computer, and more recent one at Facebook that I'll talk about in a minute. And so the basic idea of this is you have a recurrent neural net, and this recurrent neural net is kind of like a, a CPU, if you want, like a computation engine. And it interacts with a memory, or, which is a different kind of neural net that's explicitly built as a memory. So how do you build a memory that looks like a neural net? Uh, for those of you who have a background in electrical engineering and circuit design, uh, this is a RAM circuit. Okay? Uh, so essentially what uh, 
a, a differentiable memory, addressable memory looks like is you have an address that comes in, it's a vector, a continuous vector. That vector, address vector, is compared with a bunch of key uh, vectors using a dot product. So you compute a dot product between this and that, or rather the cosine of the angle, if you normalize the vector, it's the same thing, uh, between those vectors. And you get a bunch of scores here. Uh, if, the, if these are cosine of angles, you get you know, numbers between minus one and plus one. You plug those numbers into a softmax. So a softmax is a function that takes an exponential of all of its inputs and then normalize them by the sum. So you get a bunch of numbers between 0 and 1 that sum to 1. And then what you do here is you compute a weighted sum of value vectors where the coefficients are those values that are between 0 and 1 and sum to 1. And that's the output of the memory. And that's exactly what a, a, a RAM circuit does, um, uh, really. Uh, but here, this entire computation is kind of soft and differentiable, and so you, you can propagate gradient through it. And you can use this kind of architecture to kind of uh, write addresses and keys. And you can write values in it, and you can read uh, values. So if this vector matches that vector but doesn't match any of the other ones, then that value would be 1, and the other one would be very small. And so this vector will come out at the output. But if this vector matches a combination of those, then you'll get a linear combination of the corresponding values. So how does this work? Uh, the way you use this is you, um, let's say you want to build a system that can answer questions. Okay, so you, uh, you show the system the text, you encode the text into a sequence of vectors. So basically each sentence in the text is turned into a vector using a trainable neural net. Okay, and those vectors are written in the memory uh, uh, in advance, beforehand. Okay, so each uh, entry in the memory is a sentence from the text. And then what you're going to do is you're going to train uh, the, this memory network to answer questions. So you're going to write a question. This question is going to be encoded into a vector the same way the, the sentences in the uh, text are encoded into a vector. That's going to go into the neural net, which is going to produce an address for the memory and then get the result back and then crunch on it and then produce another address to access the memory again get the result back, crunch on it again. This is the same network applied at the next time step and then do this a few times. And then at the output, there is another neural net that produces the answer. And uh, the answer again coded as, as a vector or as, as a vector over possible answers, um, like a classification. And you train this entire network with backprop, with lots of questions and lots of answers and lots of different texts. And the amazing thing is that it learns how to answer questions about text. So it learns to figure out how to generate addresses to access the relevant fact that will allow it, or the multiple facts that will allow it to answer a question. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, here's a 15 sentence version of Lord of the Rings. Uh, Bilbo traveled to the cave, Gollum dropped the ring there, Bilbo took the ring, Bilbo went back to the Shire, etc. Don't read the last three sentences if you haven't read the uh, <laughs> books or seen the movies. And then you can ask questions, uh, where is the ring, where is Bilbo, etc. Uh, and it's never been trained on all the rings. It's been trained on, you know, simple stories of people moving around and taking things and dropping them, right, um, generically. Um, so my colleagues uh, uh, kind of came up with a, a series of uh, types of questions that those systems should be able to answer. So things like, you know, Sam walks into the kitchen, Sam picks up an apple, Sam walks into the bedroom, Sam drops the apple, where is the apple? Okay, so you kind of have to track a certain number of events to figure this out. Uh, and or simple inferences like Brian is a lion, Julius is a lion, Julius is white, Bernard is green, what color is Brian? Uh, you know, if you infer that all lions are white. Um, or, you know, other scenarios like this where kind of a, a sequence of actions uh, occur similar to the first one, but then the question is a little more complicated. Where was the meal before the dead? Things like that. And so there is like 20 types of questions and uh, the, this, these are called the baby tasks, uh, you know, the, with AI in the, in the middle. And the, those, are, those can be generated automatically by kind of an artificial system that kind of generates questions, you know, text, questions and answers. And so you can use them to train, uh, to train systems. And uh, a memory network or what's called an end-to-end -end memory network uh, gets about 19 of those 20 tasks uh, correct, maybe 18 of those 20 tasks correct. There's two tasks that it can't, it can't solve, the ones that involve counting and the ones that involve complicated inferences. 
So what we've been working on more recently, so a number of people have worked with this data set outside of Facebook. And one of the things we've been working on more recently, this is a paper that we submitted to uh, the iClear conference um, uh, recently. It's on archive as well. Uh, and iClear you know, publishes the paper before the conference takes place and while they're being reviewed, so you can, you can look at this paper. It's called the Entity RNN. Uh, and this is uh, work by uh, uh, my, my student, uh, PhD student at NYU, Mikhail Enaf, uh, as well as uh, Antoine Bord, Jason Weston, and Arthur Schab at Facebook AI Research. And what the system does is that it attempts to maintain a current estimate of the state of the world. So it reads sentences in a text or in a story one, one, one at a time. And then using that sentence, it attempts to kind of update its state of the world. So it's not trying to store the entire text in advance. It's kind of you know, looking at every sentence as sort of an event that changes the state of the world and it's trying to figure out how the, world, the state of the world changes. And the way it's trained again is through question and answer. So it is a story that you give the system and at some point you ask a question about the state of the world and you give the answer to that question. And by just presenting the system with this kind of data, it actually figures out how to maintain a state of the world and answer questions. So the way the system is organized is that it's kind of a, a sort of parallel distributed version of the memory network in such a way that there's a bunch of modules that are, you can think of as kind of small recurrent neural nets that have kind of a small local memory, kind of a vector memory if you want. And every time an input, and you have a, a bank of those, Every time an input comes in, each of those guys gets updated. Uh, it can choose to get updated or not. There is a gating mechanism. Uh, and, uh, and then at the next input, they get updated again. And so the system kind of learns, because at the end it has to reach a state that allows it to answer questions, uh, you propagate gradients through the entire thing, and it eventually learns what it needs to store about the state of the world. So we call this entity network because we think that a good way that the system could use to rep represent the world is to basically associate uh, one of those memory cells to each entity in the story. So when you have, for example, uh, John moves to the kitchen, you can have one of those modules that stores where John is. So basically it's associated with John and it tells where John, you know, all the properties of John. And then you can have another memory cell that is the kitchen and of course it might contain something like the content of the kitchen, right? Like who is in the kitchen, what objects are in the kitchen. And so when you have a statement like, you know, John goes to the kitchen, you have to update th those, two, uh, those two memory cells. But you'd like the system to figure out like, exactly how to represent those things, not tell it explicitly you need to have uh, one separate memory cell for each entity. And it kind of figures this out. Um, and so this is the first system that can actually solve all 20 of the baby tasks with kind of reasonable accuracy. It's not perfect, but it's, you know, uh, below a few percent error. So. <clears throat> um, so for example, to, uh, uh, when you, sh you should show the sentence, Marie got the milk uh, there, wherever there was, uh, you know, there are kind of uh, entities that, uh, uh, you know, get activated whenever each of those uh, statements uh, occurs and, uh, and et cetera. So, for example, there is, you know, something about football here. So, the, you know, the, some key gets activated and, and, you know, the location of it gets activated and, you know, things like that. So these are the, the activations that the system uses to kind of answer this question, where is the milk? Okay, uh, so now let me switch gear to um, talk about obstacles to, to AI. Um, and that's when I'm gonna talk about unsupervised running. So uh, we've talked about perception, which is a, a central piece of an AI system. We've talked about memory, uh, a little bit about reasoning, not so much. Not so much about planning either, uh, but planning and reasoning are kind of similar things. Um, but there is a missing piece in an AI system, which is a predictive model. So what you'd like, and in fact the entity network is kind of motivated a little bit by this, what you need is, in an AI system, is you need the system to have the ability to predict what's going to happen in the world, just because the world is the world, or because, uh, uh, because of a consequence of, of, of its own actions. Um, you need a machine to be able to fill in the blanks. So if you're only seeing my left profile, you can pretty much figure out what my right profile looks like because you know that people are symmetric, more or less. 
Um, there is a, an entire area of your visual field where you're blind, but you don't realize it. You're not conscious of it because your brain fills in the blanks. Uh, you're blind in this area because that's where the optical nerve punches through your retina. So you don't have any sensors at that location in your, in your retina. Um, if I say uh, a sentence like, like this, Tom picked up the bag and left the room, there's a lot of blanks you can fill in because you know the constraints of the world. So you can say that, you, you can tell that uh, Tom is going to have to stand up, extend his arm uh, around his, his bag, close his, his hand, he's probably going to walk, he's probably not going to fly, he's not going to dematerialize like this guy here. Uh, he's not going to fly through the wall, he's probably going to have to go through the door, maybe open it. So there's a lot of things you can imagine uh, from just those few words because you know how the world works. That's what we call common sense, right? Um, similarly, there is a classical problem in AI called uh, Winograd schema. So it's a sentence like the one at the top. The trophy doesn't fit in the suitcase because it's too large. So you know that the it refers to the trophy. But if I say the trophy doesn't fit in the suitcase because it's too small, then the it refers to the suitcase. And so the only way you can lift this ambiguity as to what the pronoun refers to is if you know how the world works, you know the constraints, you know, you know something about the physical constraints of the world or conceptual constraints of the world. That's, that's what we call common sense, and that, that's what AI, machines, AI systems don't have uh, these days. Uh, common sense is really the missing, the missing piece of, of, of AI. How do we get machines to acquire common sense? So one argument I'm, I'm going to make is, is that the uh, only way to get machines to learn enough knowledge about the world to acquire common sense is to uh, train them in an unsupervised manner. So basically, train them like human babies and uh, animals uh, train themselves by just observing the world and acting in it. And it's unsupervised in the sense that no one is feeding them labels. Uh, no one is necessarily feeding them rewards either. Uh, but you learn how the world works by observation. Um, and so when you learn by observation, you learn, for example, if you train yourself to predict the immediate future or the long-term future, you get a lot of information from the world. The, the world gives you a huge amount of information because you just observe what the next state of the world is going to be. And that's an enormous amount of information that is fed back to your system that it needs to predict. It's much more information than if you train supervised when you give an image to the system and you ask it to produce a label and then you give it the label. It's just a few bits. Maybe a few hundred bits, maybe a few thousand bits. But it's really not that many. And it's way more than if you use reinforcement learning where reinforcement learning is that you wait for the machine to make, uh, produce an action, and then you reward it or not. Uh, this is kind of like how you train a, a pet or something, or a circus animal. Uh, but uh, it's incredibly inefficient if you do it as a, in, in its purest form. So the, all the successes of reinforcement learning that you've seen in the past, so there is uh, uh, you know, the Atari uh, game player from, uh, from DeepMind a few years ago. Uh, the, the, the Go player, also uh, DeepMind produced, which uses a combination of imitation learning and reinforcement learning. Uh, there is a Doom player that uh, was produced at Facebook that won the last VizDoom competition, uh, used pure reinforcement learning uh, from the raw image, essentially. Uh, those work, but they require a huge amount of training samples. And it's just not practical in the real world. It works for uh, video games because you can run them faster than real time. But, you know, it's kind of sad, but you can't run the real world faster than real time. It's kind of annoying. Um, so how do you run the real world faster than real time? What you do is you build a world simulator. And that's basically what learning machines need to do. They need to build a world simulator that allows them to predict what's going to happen as a consequence of their actions, or just because the world is going to evolve. And that's what unsupervised predictive learning is all about. So the joke I've made is that because of the amount of information that's provided to the system in this different form of learning, uh, if you visualize intelligence as a cake, the bulk of the cake, the genoise, if you want, is unsupervised learning. The icing on the cake is supervised learning, and the cherry on the cake is reinforcement learning. You do want a cherry on your cake. It's very important. Um, but most of the learning is going to be done unsupervised. Most of the learning that we do as humans or animals um, is unsupervised. Most of the stuff that we learn about the world, we learn in the first few weeks, months, and years of life before we learn how to speak. Uh, the stuff we learned at university is kind of, you know, a bit of icing on top of it. Very important icing. So what's the architecture of an intelligent system? Um, you could think of an intelligent system really as composed of three main modules. One is this uh, 
So one, one is the, the world, okay? That's not the intelligent system, that's just the world that the intelligent system interacts with. So it produces actions on the world and then gets percepts from the world, which allows it to estimate the state of the world, essentially. And then the agent really uh, has two module, modules. Uh, one uh, is the agent proper, and the other one is some immutable objective function that the agent tries to optimize. So basically what drives the agent to do things is that it wants to optimize its objective function. Its objective function tells it whether it's happy or not. We have something like this in our brain. The stuff that makes us uh, wake up every day and actually do stuff um, is a thing like this red box. Okay? And it's really not a single box. It's a bunch of different boxes uh, that tells us you know, to feed and to drink and reproduce and work, etc. So what is the structure of this agent? What does it have to do to be able to act intelligently? Well, first of all, it has to be able to predict uh, what the consequences of its actions uh, are going to be or what the state of the world is, is, um, is, you know, is, how the state of the world is going to evolve so that it can uh, intervene at the right time and, and in the right way. So that's the, this world simulator, uh, this, this green box here. That's an emulator for the world. And that's what allows the system to stimu simulate the world faster than real time, essentially. There's an actor that produces action proposals and then reads the inferred state of the world. Uh, the world simulator, of course, needs to be initialized by perception. Uh, and then there is a critic, and the, the role of the critic is to basically predict the long-term expected value of this objective. So basically, you know, I'm going to take this action, it's gonna have this result on the, on the world, tell me if in the long run this is good for me or not. Okay, and that needs to be trained as well. Um, and so, you know, you always have you know, the, the trade-off between long-term and short-term, right? Should I, uh, um, you, know, you know, have this piece of chocolate cake I was showing you earlier here? Uh, your reptilian brain says calories, get it, right? And your frontal cortex says, wait a minute, this is probably not so good for you, it's like full of calories, so you're gonna, you know, get fat and all that stuff, right? Um, so you have those kind of conflicting predictions and conflicting actions which depend on you know, whether your objective kind of cares about the long term or the short term. Um, that has political consequences, like you know, should we deal with uh, global warming, for example, right? Or is it something that we should leave for future generations to take care of? Um, not a very controversial question in, in the, uh, today. Okay, so the way the, the system is gonna have to be trained is that you know, you're gonna get a percept from the world the perception module is going to give you an idea of the initial state of the world and then you're going to simulate the world uh, according to a sequence of actions produced by the actor and uh, hopefully generate the sequence of action that can you know, optimize the expected prediction of the, of the objective function computed by the critic. And this is just a giant recurrent neural net that you can train with backpack. Um, the world simulator may need to be trained separately to kind of predict how the world uh, evolves. And we know how to do, we know how to build a red box, we know how to build a blue box, more or less. This is the hard part. Learning predictive foreign models of the world. Why is it hard? It's hard because the world is not predictable. Uh, so here is a case where the world is almost predictable. Uh, take a, an image from a, a 3D video game, okay? Uh, this is the Unreal game engine that we hooked up to a torch infrastructure plug a commercial net and train the commercial net to predict what's going to happen to those blocks. Are they going to fall? Where are they going to fall? And it actually kind of works. So, uh, actually let me show you a better example. So here is a tall tower. This is what actually happens to those blocks and this is what the neural net predicts is going to happen. You get kind of fuzzy prediction because it's not entirely sure what's going to happen to this uh, yellow uh, block here. But you know, it does a decent job and it actually works also for real blocks even though it's only been trained with uh, artificial images. But you get those fuzzy predictions because there are many things that can happen that are essentially that are very hard to predict and so you get kind of an average of all the possible features. And that's really the problem of unsupervised learning. Um, so let me kind of formulate unsupervised learning a little bit uh, more clearly. Uh, we have two variables, y1 and y2. And we observe things like that. So perhaps we've observed past video frames and our current video frame has two pixels and all the pixels fall into those, all the images, all the examples that we see in our training set fall into this curve. So what you'd like is you'd like to train a, a machine to tell you whether a new point belongs to the same set or not. A contrast function that basically 
takes low value on the points and higher value everywhere else. If you are a probabilist, think of this as a negative log likelihood function. But if you are a physicist, think of it as an energy function. So what we want is uh, train this, this function, this surface, which is really uh, implemented by neural net, in such a way that the output, which is a scalar, is going to be low for training samples and higher for everything else. And the problem is how to make it higher for everything else. Um, and, you know, in the past, I've, I've kind of uh, listed seven or eight different methods, different methods on how to make the energy outside of data points higher than, uh, higher than on the data points. And I'm not going to go through them because there is a very interesting one that just popped up in the last few years called adversarial training. Um, actually, I have a misspelling here, which I should have fixed. Um, and here's the basic problem it solves and the basic idea uh, behind it. So the basic problem it solves is, is the following. You want to uh, make a machine that predicts the future. So it gets frames from a video, that's X, and you ask it to predict what the world is going to look like half a second later, let's say, a quarter second later. So here are videos that you train the system with. You train it with uh, someone putting a pen on the table and lifting the finger and the pen falls. And the entire training set is composed of that, okay? Uh, and so the system has to basically predict what's going to happen to the pen. And of course, it can't possibly predict that the pen is going to fall in one direction or the other because it's very hard, right? You, you can't really tell how the finger is going to be lifted. And so perhaps what the system is going to predict is this, that the pen is going to fall to the left. But in fact, what the future says, what the data says, is that the pen in this particular instance falls to the back. So conceptually, the prediction was correct. It's just, you know, in, tr in pixel terms, it was wrong. And so what you'd like is you'd like to tell the system, OK, you got it wrong, but you really didn't get it wrong conceptually because your prediction is actually on this set of plausible futures. And so I'm not going to punish you for making the wrong prediction as long as it's on the manifold of possible futures. But then the next question you have to ask is, how do you characterize this manifold of possible futures, the set of possible futures? Okay, and we're going to learn that too. So basically we're going to have a second neural net that is going to learn this set and it's going to make this network pay for producing a point that's outside of this set. And that network is going to compute an energy function similar to the one I was mentioning just before. Okay, so what this second network has to do is learn a function, a contrast function like this that gives uh, low energy to real points, real data points, and higher energy to everything else. And here is how this works. This is the idea of adversarial training. So this is an idea that came from Ian Goodfellow, who at the time was a student, uh, a PhD student with Yosha Benjo at University of Montreal. He's uh, now a research scientist at OpenAI in California. Uh, and this is kind of the energy-based form of adversarial training, which is uh, different from the original formulation from Ian. So you have a generator network that takes the past and takes a source of random numbers. So the, what the random numbers will allow the predictor to do is predict different points on this manifold of possibilities. Okay. And this guy generates green points, which may or may not be correct. They may or may not be good predictions. The good predictions are the blue points because they are what comes from your data set. And so you draw a, a data point from the data set. So this is the next frame in the video, uh, given the, the past video frames. And those are the blue points. And you train the second network to produce a low output, a low energy. Okay? So this network computes this surface, if you want, which is now being modified because it's being trained. And then you uh, use your generator to produce green points. And initially, the green points are going to be you know, at random places because this generator is not trained. And what the discriminator, what you do to the discriminator is you train it, you adjust it, its parameter so this output goes up. Okay, so this guy learns to discriminate real, real data points from fake data points generated by the generator. Okay, but what's happening next is that the generator gets the gradient of the output of the discriminator with respect to its input and adjusts its own parameter so that its output gets closer to something the discriminator will think is real. Okay, so the generator is trying to fool the discriminator by generating green points that are as close as possible to the blue points. Okay, but it doesn't matter exactly where on the surface. So as the generator trains, those green points get closer and closer to the blue points. 
and uh, yeah. And so eventually, when the system stabilizes, it's kind of a, a game, you know, in, you know, it's like a Nash equilibrium kind of thing. You can prove it's a Nash equilibrium, where uh, there's an equilibrium where the generator generates points that this discriminator can't tell the difference with the real data. And the discriminator is pretty good at telling whether a point actually, you know, is real data or is is not, but not from this generator. And so, a stunning success happened uh, a couple of years ago, where uh, these three gentlemen, Sumit Chitala is at Facebook, uh, Bradford is at OpenAI. At the time, he was in the startup company uh, that he had created, and they trained a. Uh, adversarial network to uh, produce images of bedrooms. So there's no X, there's a bunch of random numbers here, about 100, and then you uh, build a sort of a reverse convolutional net to produce uh, images of bedrooms, and you train it with real bedrooms. And these are generated bedrooms from this network, and they look really nice. They have beds, and they have windows, and they have dressers, and, and they don't, they're not any bedroom that was shown during training. Uh, it's real resolution though, 64 by 64. Uh, you can also train them to interpolate between manga characters um, <laughs> and create new manga characters. You can do arithmetics on faces. So you can figure out what input vector, what z vector, random vector would map to a particular face. You can do this by creating descent or some other means. And so you know in the z space, uh, you know, what, what z vector will produce this face. And you can compute what z-vector will produce that face, and what z-vector will produce that face. And then you, you get the z-vector for this guy, minus the z-vector for that guy, plus the z-vector for that lady, and you get a z-vector that generates one of those ladies. And so you do, you know, analogy arithmetics, man with glasses minus man without glasses plus woman without glasses equals woman with glasses. Or in another way, man with glasses minus man without glasses equals woman with glasses minus woman without glasses, which makes sense in that embedding space. So what we have now is some sort of the holy grail of uh, generative model, which is a way to parameterize very complicated high dimensional surfaces by just a few parameters so that when you change those parameters, you get a point on the surface. It's, you know, that's kind of a, a very big tool that nobody had before and that uh, adversarial training basically gives us. Um, there's a particular form of it which I'm not going to go into the details of, which corresponds to a particular architecture for the discriminator. Um, and that has allowed us to, which is basically an autoencoder, which has allowed us to generate relatively high resolution images from those GANs. So these are, this is a system that was trained on the ImageNet data set. Uh, and, and so ImageNet is a bunch of photos of objects where the object is roughly centered. And if you're in the back of the room, uh, you, see, you know, you think those images look kind of nice. And if you're in the front of the room, you look in detail and you say, what the hell is this? There's no object there. There's like no object I can recognize, right? I mean, what, what is this? <laughs> or what is that? It's kind of, it was got a wing of an airplane, kind of a sail, and it's like, it looks like a, like a TGV or something, a fast train. Or <laughs> but it's like in the air, on top of water. I mean, you know, it's kind of a mixture of all kinds of transportation things. Uh, you really can't tell what any of those things are. Uh, but it sort of capture the, the general uh, kind of uh, statistics of natural images, if you want. Here is what you get if you train on dogs. So you get soft dogs. You get, uh, you know, Sabad Dai dogs, you know, surreal dogs. Um, so, you know, it's not perfect, but, um, but it's, kind of, it's kind of cool. Those are high resolution, 256 by 256. And you can also train those systems to do video prediction. So you have a multi-scale convolutional net, and if you train a, if you feed it with four frames and you ask it to predict the next couple frames, uh, using least square, for example, to train with least square, here's the kind of prediction you get. You get very fuzzy prediction. So you have four observed frames, and then the last two frames are predicted, and you get very, very fuzzy predictions, because what you get is an average of all the possible predictions that the system can make. But if you train with adversarial training, so this is with least square, this is with adversarial training. So you train another network to tell you whether the prediction looks nice or not. Another conventional net. It also observes the past. And the predictions are much nicer. 
Uh, same here, it sort of does a pretty good job at kind of extrapolating what should ha happen to the bow, to the wire, to the baby, to et cetera. Uh, this is a similar system. Uh, this one was trained on videos that were shot in apartments in New York that someone kind of pans the camera around. And so the interesting thing about this, so the, the blue, uh, when it's circled in blue, the, these are observed frame, and then the red ones are predicted. So this predicts five frames in the future. And the interesting thing is that the system has to kind of dream up what the part of the apartment is that it's not seeing. Right? As the camera moves, it's got to invent what the apartment looks like. Um, so, you know, there is a bookcase this here, a library, and it has to kind of synthesize the rest of the library, essentially. You know, same here, the bookcase, those left part of the bookcase here are kind of completely dreamed up. Um, so it's kind of cool. Uh, but if you let it run for more than a few frames, it, it, goes, it goes bonkers. So this is a 50 frame prediction, and after a while it gets washed out, and you know, things, things go bad. So what we need to work on is some ways for the system to kind of abstract the notion of objects and the 3D structure of the world and things like this so that they can, uh, you know, do high level prediction at the long run. And perhaps that would be the secret to building prediction system because prediction is the essence of intelligence and then uh, make machines more intelligent through unsupervised running. Thank you very much.